So today, I am uh, sharing the word today. If you've ever heard me uh, speak before, maybe, maybe you've heard a little bit of my story and stuff. I don't, I don't always get into it. It's, it's enough to say, like, it's kind of a mess, right? It's kind of a mess. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a mess now, but I was a bigger ne- mess before. Um, but one of the things that, that I'm very passionate about is, is the power of the scriptures. I really believe the scripture that says that we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Because I've seen that, I've seen that in actuality in my own life. Like, you know, if you don't know my story, I was, I was in homeless programs. I was like homeless at 20 years old. I, I, I was pretty much born again in the gutter, almost, almost literally. Um, and God did a miraculous work in my life. It was surely the grace of God had nothing to do with me. I didn't do anything awesome that made God say, hey, that guy's pretty awesome. I'm going to bless him or whatever. No, I was absolutely lost in my own depravity. God did his special thing that only he could do and, uh, and miraculously changed my life. And, and really one of the ways that it was uh, through was through the scriptures. So I would read, read the Bible, read the scriptures. And, and like many people, I think at first, like I didn't kind of understand what was going on. I didn't quite get it. But as I kind of got my, my sea legs, if you will, like when you're on a ship, it takes you a little while to get adjusted to the feeling of the waves. Like I kind of started to feel like I had my, my foundation under me a little bit when I was navigating the Bible. And then it just started to kind of come to life and, and really changed my life. It really absolutely changed my life. If anybody ever looks at me and is like, I can't even imagine you like sleeping behind a dumpster when you're 20 years old. Literally, it's because of God. It's literally because of God and because of the power of, of God's word in my life, right? So um, one of the things that I like to say and I like to talk about is that scripture is, scripture is very is deep. It's like infinitely deep. And, and there's many stories that we can read. Like I've, I've talked about this when I preached on Lazarus. It's like anybody who's grown up in church or even been to church a couple of times probably has an idea. Oh, Lazarus was a guy. He died and like Jesus raised him from the dead. Hooray, like end of story. But when you scratch the surface on some of those stories, some of those even familiar stories, we see that there's a whole lot going on there. Stuff that maybe we missed the first time, the second time. I see stuff. I've read things 50 times. There's still new things that come to life because the word of God is inexhaustible. So we're going to put that a little bit to the test today with a famous story that you may or may not have heard before. It's a story about Jesus and a, an adulteress, a, a woman caught in adultery. A woman caught in adultery. So we'll pick it up here. At the, at the beginning of the scene, right? The scene, if you will, they're in the temple. This is the religious center. This is like the, the center of life for the Jewish people back in the day. It was the temple. Everybody would go to the temple. It was like every day, it was like the hustle and bustle of crowds. And Jesus started his ministry. And at this point in time for the story, he is meeting people in the temple. It says that at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. So it's a whole crowd of people that are there. All the people gather around him, and he sat down to teach them. Now the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, the religious people, right, the the religious leaders that were all bent out of shape because this guy Jesus was attracting a following, and that meant that the people weren't following them anymore. They were following after Jesus. So they're all bent out of shape about this stuff. It's like pride. It's envy. It's all this stuff that we still deal with, you know, honestly today. Um, So they come and they bring a woman caught in adultery, and they make her stand before the whole group. So as we read at the top there, this is the temple. It's the hustle and bustle, the crowds. Not only is Jesus sitting down and teaching a group of people, but even outside of that group of people, it's like crowds all over the place in the temple, hustle and bustle, and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the, the, the teachers of the law, they bring this woman who's caught in adultery to stand before all these people And they say to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act, caught in the act of adultery. We didn't just hear about it. We caught her in the act. So a couple of questions come up here when you're reading this. One is, where's the guy? Where's the guy? Right? Where's the guy? Anybody who reads this story objectively can can come to that conclusion and be like, something is missing here, right? Like she's caught in adultery with somebody. Where's the dude? So, so you ask yourself, well, well, there's some ideas like maybe, maybe he ran away. Maybe they got caught and this dude was like, I'm out and ran away naked or whatever. Like, who knows? Or maybe, I know, right? Or maybe, maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe they're, maybe they're making an example of her. Maybe they know the guy and they don't want him to be in trouble, but, but who, whatever it was, right? We see here that she's made to stand before the group and, say, and they say to Jesus, teacher, this woman is caught in the act of adultery. Now watch what they want to do with her, right? So... 
Here we go. In the law of Moses, they say to Jesus in front of this woman, in front of these crowds of people, they have all the attention of all these people, right? And in that moment, they are accusing her. It's a sham trial in front of all these people. How do you think that woman felt, by the way, to be all alone in front of all these people? And it says here, they're saying in the law, Jesus, Moses commanded us to stone such women. That is, pick up stones and each and every one of us throw stones at this woman until she is dead. So this woman is probably absolutely terrified. Terrified. This is a life and death situation. Not only is it public humiliation and shame, but her life is literally on the line here. In the law, they tell Jesus, Moses commanded us to stone such women. There was other sins that you could do back then, back in the day, that that were, were, according to the law, worthy of capital punishment. And this was one of them. It says that they were using this question against Jesus as a trap. They're always trying to trap Jesus, right? They're always trying to get him to say something, to make a mistake, to, to misstep, and they can be like, ha, we told you, this guy is a sinner and a loser, right? That's what, that's what they're always trying to do. So it says right there, they're asking this question as a trap in order to have a basis for Accusing him. Let's go on. We'll come back to some of this stuff in a minute. Let's go on in the story. So we get, but Jesus, when they're trying to trap him and they're questioning him and they're saying, hey, in the law, Moses says we're supposed to stone these women, women like this, people caught in this kind of sin. What do you think, Jesus? Well, Jesus, Jesus doesn't even answer him at first, right? It says Jesus doesn't even answer him. He, he does like some kind of a, it's like a gangster move or something like that. He's just, he just, they're all up in his face like, hey, what's going on? Tell us the answer. What do you think, Jesus? And Jesus just he says he bends over and he starts writing in the dust. It's like, who does that? Who does that? And famously in the story, right, they keep on questioning him. And eventually after a while, he straightens up and he says to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to cast a, cast a stone at her. If you guys want to stone this woman to death, whoever ain't got no sin, why don't you go ahead and pick up that first stone and start it, start it up. And again, right after saying that, he stoops and he starts writing on the ground again, right? It's so interesting. Jesus' way of handling people is, is pretty, uh, pretty awesome. So at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. Jesus is saying, whoever's got no sin, be the first to cast a stone. And you can picture this crowd of leaders, this crowd of teachers of the law and fancy people. And it says that the oldest, beginning with the oldest, they start to leave and walk away because they know that their life isn't sinless, that they have made some mistakes, right? And it's interesting that it says the oldest were the first ones to walk away. They went away one at a time, the older ones first. Because how many of you know when you get older, you start to, you start to realize a little bit, like you've, got, you've traveled some more road. You've made some, made some mistakes that you remember, right? So sometimes uh, when you're older, that's what happens to you. And it says the older ones went away first. And eventually, all of the younger ones started going away too. Until who's left? It's just the woman and Jesus, and they're just standing there in front of this crowd. So Jesus straightens up, and he asks her, Woman, where are they? Where's your accusers? Where are the ones that brought you in front of all these people? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she looks around. She's probably trembling like a leaf. And she looks around, and she says, No one, sir. And he says, well, then neither do I condemn you. And he says, he declares it. Neither do I condemn you. Now go now and go back to that adulterous relationship that you just came from. Is that what he says? He doesn't say that. Go back and get with whoever you want to because it's all good. Sin's not a big deal. Does he say that? He doesn't say that. It says, go now and leave your life of sin. Some other translations say, go and sin no more. So sin was still a thing, right? It was still a thing. It was acknowledged that that was a sin, a sinful behavior. He didn't gloss it over and he was like, ah, don't worry about that. We didn't mean that when we wrote that, that law. He didn't gloss over the sinful behavior. He acknowledged it. And he said, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. So it's interesting. Remember, remember the facts here. The Pharisees and the religious leaders, they're trying to trap Jesus. Like, what's he going to say? Because in the law, it says that we're supposed to stone such women, right? So the trap is this. 
If he says, yes, the law says we're supposed to stone women, go for it. Well, obviously, that's kind of against like his character. He wasn't really known for going around stoning sinners like while he was on earth, was he? He wasn't, he wasn't known for that. And also, whether, you, whether, you're, whether we realize this or not, um, you know, the Romans had come in and actually taken over their whole country. So the Romans were actually held the, the Jewish people under their heel. It was like under, under their thumb. And it was so bad that the Romans said, you guys can't even do capital punishment yourself. Like we take away that right from you. And that's why you see in the trial of Jesus, they go to Pilate because Pilate was a Roman governor and he was the one that had the power to put Jesus to death because the Jews didn't have the power to do that themselves anymore. So if Jesus said, yes, stone her, first of all, they're probably gonna stone her and it's not gonna be great. Second of all, they're gonna just turn around and say, look, Jesus, you just violated this whole Roman thing that we're under. You are acting as the judge, the jury, and the executioner and they're gonna point at him and that's why it's a trap on one way. And the other way, if he says, no, we're not going to stone her, then they're going to accuse him of not upholding the law of Moses, not being religious, not being a good Jew. And in front of all these people, people are going to start shaking their heads and be like, yeah, I mean, this is right. Like he's not upholding the law. So it's a trap. They have a trap for him. Now let's see again. I want to I take a moment here. I want to see again what Jesus is supposed to do here, what he actually does here, okay? So the response Let's go back and look at this response. Now, Jesus, remember they're saying, in the law, Jesus, Moses says that we're supposed to stone people guilty of these sins. What do you think? And Jesus ain't even answering them. It says they kept on questioning him, but what is he doing? He's like bent over, drawn in the ground, doing whatever. Have you ever talked to somebody and they're not paying attention to you? Have you ever tried to talk to somebody, tell them something serious, but they're on their phone? Oh my gosh. This happens, what about at work or something like that? And you're like trying to explain something to some, or your kids trying to explain something and maybe like while you're trying to, you're being serious, you're trying to explain stuff and that person is just like swipe, 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 type, 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 LOL emoji, swipe, swipe, swipe. And you're getting like furious because you're talking and you're talking and you're talking and it's like clear as day this person is not listening to you, right? That's almost what it feels like with what Jesus is doing. He didn't have a phone, but he's sitting there and they're talking at him. It says they kept on questioning him. What's up, Jesus? You got to tell us. You got to tell us. And he's just there and he's just like, uh-huh. He's writing in the dust. He's doing whatever. And they keep on questioning him and keep on questioning him. He just stands up, says, let whoever's got no sin cast the first stone. And then he goes right back to it. He goes right back down and he starts drawing in the ground again. What a move. What a move here. Now, I think it's interesting, and I want to show this for a second here. I think it's interesting because what is he, what is he right with here? Yeah, is he writing with his like staff? Does he have like a staff and he's like writing with his staff? Does he take a stick? He goes and finds a stick and he like writes in the ground with his stick. No, it's, it's, this is going to be important here. It's, it's very well spelled out that he actually does it with his finger. The same way that I'm using this iPad to circle that with his Finger, right? Terribly. Finger. Jesus is writing with his finger. Right in the ground. Now, how the Bible works, like I was saying a little bit before, sometimes the Bible, you got to scratch the surface a little bit, right? And I've learned over time that when you're reading the Bible and something kind of doesn't make sense, like, why would you put that detail in there? Why is he writing with his finger? Like, why do you, the author of this story here. Why does John want us to know that Jesus was using his finger? Where have we seen the finger of God in action before is a question that you have to ask yourself. That's how the Bible works. When you see something that doesn't quite make sense, you're supposed to be like, hey, why does that look kind of weird? Where else have we seen, where else have we seen the finger of God in scriptures? Where else was that finger, that same finger that was writing in the dust there, where have we seen that finger before? Well, yeah. Well, we have seen it before very few times in the Bible, very few times in the Bible. But one time, one time, back in the day, in the days of Moses, it was actually when the law was given, the same law that these guys were trying to get this woman on. 
Moses went up Mount Sinai, remember? And it was all crazy. And Moses went up there and Moses had an encounter with God, with the Lord. And the Lord took his finger and wrote, and it actually says that he engraved with his finger on those tablets of stone, the 10 commandments and gave them to Moses. And Moses carried them back down the mountain, but they were engraved and written with the finger of God in the stone. Let's look at it. When the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him this two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by what? The finger of God. We see it again. It says here, the tablets at the end of this verse, the tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God. It was in God's handwriting engraved on the tablets. How hot does your finger have to be to literally engrave in a stone as you're writing on it? How powerful does that finger of God have to be? And that same finger that wrote and engraved in the tablets of stone is that same finger now that's bent over and writing in the dust. I have a question. What have they... What, they, what happened to those tablets of stone anyway? What do they do with those 10 commandments? What do they do with them? Where did they go? Like Moses just like, I don't know, threw them away or something? No. They actually placed them inside this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. That's one of these things that's kind of like, these days it's kind of like thought of as a legend, right? I mean, there's, a, there's an Indiana Jones movie about it later. What is it? Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark or something, right? It's like, it's like one of those things like maybe you hear about in pop culture. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant or whatever. But back in the day, the Ark of the Covenant was thought of as basically the throne of God here on earth. And when the Jewish people, the Israelites were out in the desert and they were walking around, they actually would carry this thing with them wherever they went. And maybe it looks something We'll go to, maybe it looks something like this. This might be a poor artist description, but it's close. Maybe it's close. It was like a big chest overlaid with gold with angels on top, with a lid with angels on top. And it says that Moses put those tablets, those, those two things that have been written by the finger of God, put them into the ark. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, so I want to ask, what else was in that ark that they were so worried about carrying around with them everywhere they went? They carried around the tablets of stone from Moses, the Ten Commandments. Everywhere they went, they carried this thing around. We read in Hebrews, there was also a couple other things in there. There was the golden pot that had the manna, so the manna that fell from heaven was in there. So now we have two things. We have the tablets of stone, we have the golden pot of manna, and we have... Aaron's rod, Aaron's staff that had budded. There was three things in there. And above it, above that, that ark, above that chest was a lid that they called the mercy seat. And they believed that the presence of God, and it did some way, the presence of God sat and rested upon the top of that mercy seat. And that's why when the Jews finally were in Jerusalem and they built a temple, the ark actually went into the most holy place in all of Jerusalem, the holy of holies, the holiest place even in the temple. That was where the ark rested. And the presence of God rested on top of it like God on his throne. And inside and underneath that mercy seat were these three things. The manna, the Ten Commandments, tablets, and the rod of Aaron that had budded. So that leads me to my next question is, what do those three things have in common? What do those three things have in common? Now, you can say it's the miraculous provision of God. You can say it's the miraculous power of God. I believe it. It shows like a miracle. Miracles happen. God moved. And that's why they were holding these things in the ark and carrying them around wherever they went. But if you look at these stories, if you scratch the surface on these stories, you see that it has something in common and it's kind of a surprising thing. You see, Aaron's rod that had budded, we'll start with the second one first. Aaron's rod had budded the reason that that staff, it was a staff, the reason that that thing budded and blossomed and leafed, like when you cut down a stick, you cut a branch off a tree, that thing's not gonna like produce new fruit, right? It's not gonna produce fruit and leaves. It's dead. 
And what had happened was that the Israelites in the desert actually were in full-on rebellion against Aaron and Moses and God himself. And they came before Moses, a group of people, and said, what is the deal with you? Do you think that you're the only one that the Spirit of God talks to? Is not the Spirit of God with us too? Who made you king over us? And they come up against him and they basically want to kill him and Aaron. And they want to appoint a different leader and do whatever. And the Lord speaks through Moses and says, have the leaders of these people, all the people, have the leaders take their staffs, that symbol of their authority, their staff, and put it before me and have Aaron put his staff before me too. And whichever one miraculously overnight blooms and blossoms, that is the one that I have chosen because I am the Lord and I'm tired of this rebellion. Read about it. That's number 16 and 17. Well, then what about the manna? You remember the manna fell from heaven and God gave them instructions about what to do with the manna. It was like, hey, on the sixth day, I'm gonna give you extra manna out there that's gonna show up miraculously because on the seventh day, I don't want you guys going out and doing anything because that's the Sabbath. And what do the people do? They go right out there on the seventh day and they're looking for stuff and there's nothing there and God is mad at them. He says, how long are you gonna be not listening to my words, what I'm telling you to do? And then later on, they're spending years out there and it says that they're eating like the bread of angels. I don't even understand it. The word manna actually means what is it in Hebrew because they didn't understand it either. It was just like the bread of angels or something miraculously. And after years of eating that, the people actually rebelled. They got tired of it. And they're like, we're tired of this garbage. Well, I want meat. And they come up in rebellion to Moses. We want meat. What is this trash? We're tired of it. And God provides quail And then a plague comes upon the people. It's rebellion. And the Ten Commandments, when they're given the third thing, the Ten Commandments, Moses comes down the mountain. Remember the first time Moses comes down the mountain and he finds Israel has gone wild. They have gone wild. They're like sinning like crazy. They've forgotten Moses. They've forgotten the Lord. They made golden calves and said, this is the Lord. This is the Lord that brought us out of Egypt. This is our new God. Let's worship this golden calf. Moses was so blown away that he took those tablets and smashed them on the ground. I had to go back up the mountain and get a new pair. So these three things, yes, I believe that they symbolize the great provision, the great miracles of God, but they also have rebellion of God's people in common. The rebellion of God's people. Remember, those things are inside the ark, the chest. And on top of it is this lid over the chest that keeps it closed. It's called the mercy seat upon which the presence of God sits like his throne on earth. The weight of God and the image is that the weight of God himself. How heavy is God? The weight of God himself sits on top of that lid and that mercy seat, that seat of mercy. And underneath that seat of mercy is the great rebellion and sin of his people. But God himself covers that great iniquity and his amazing mercy and grace. You see, we say, and we know in the Bible, it says that love covers a multitude of sins. The greatest and most grievous of sins even. The caught guilty and dead to rights kind of sin. The things that keep you up at night kind of stuff. Maybe you're like me, like, Sometimes it's three in the morning and I'm thinking about what happened to me in second grade and something dumb that I did. And I'm like, I'm like anxious about it. I'm like, why did I say that to my teacher in second grade? But why, why? But that happens, like we're humans, right? It happens. And so sometimes it's like playful. It's like something, something ridiculous. And I'm like, Randy, why are you even worried about that, man? That's so long ago. Nobody cares, right? But then there's other things. There's other things in my life. I think there's things in all of our lives where, where sometimes it's like little whatever things, but sometimes the things that can, can kind of crawl up out of our heart or whatever and feel like they're choking on our throat is things that we've done in the past. I've done some stupid things. I told you where I came from. I've done some terrible things, man. But the love of God covers a multitude of sins. 
even the terrible things. Now, I share these stories, and it's like, I don't want to share these stories, right? Have some grace on me. I don't want to share these stories. But I need to illustrate this point. Even our greatest and most grievous are, are the, the things that keep us up. I remember being like 18 years old. I did not know the Lord. I was fully in the world. I was like two years from being homeless, right? So I was on a rough trajectory. I remember we had just graduated high school. I just graduated high school. I was like 18 years old. We went on a camping trip to celebrate our, like, our high school graduation. And we went there with a bunch of friends, and my friend was there, and he brought along his girlfriend or whatever, which I didn't like that girl at all for some reason. She did nothing wrong. She did nothing wrong. I was just a jerk. I was just a jerk. Let me be clear. I was a jerk. She did nothing wrong. It was on me. It was my bad. And I remember, because when you're going on in like high school parties, like you're drinking and doing stupid things, because that's what we're doing, and I got a little mouthy and a little too drunk, and I just got in her face, and I was like, I cannot stand you. You are so gross to me. I think you're like the ugliest girl I've ever seen. You look like a man. What's wrong with you? You're disgusting. And I was just, la I was just laughing in her face, because I thought I was the funniest guy in the world. And I look back on that now, and I'm like, how, how terrible how terrible a thing. I did it for like probably the entire night. I would just come back around and come back and just start up again. It is terrible. But even our terrible sins, the things that we've done that make us feel bad, I still feel bad about that. And you could say, well, Pastor Randy, you're 18 years old. You were just a kid. You didn't even know the Lord yet. I'm like, yeah, but wait till I tell you more. Because <laughs> sin doesn't just you know, you don't just stop messing up when you become a Christian. Does anybody learn that the hard way? <laughs> right? I learned that the hard way. My wife and I have been married for 17 years. She's seen me at my highs and my lows, man. She's seen a lot of my lows. I remember we were married for like a year, like a year or something. And uh, I was a Christian, I guess. I was. And uh, I told her one time, I, I, cooked up, I cooked up this great idea. And I was like, babe, um, I think that I need, I really feel, like the Lord is really telling me, Lord, babe, that, uh, that I feel like I need to go and have like a spiritual retreat. I'm going to go, I know this campsite that, that's out in Vermont, it's like a, it's like a cabin. And what, what I think that God is telling me, babe, is that I'm supposed to go and like fast for a couple days and like hang out at this cabin and really seek the Lord, babe. And while I do that, because I think it's best that we kind of like, you know, you're maybe doing your own thing. Why don't you stay here and you seek the Lord and fast and then we'll come back together afterwards, and I'll tell you how spiritual I was. Basically, that's why I told her. What I didn't tell her was that I was holding on to like 30 bucks worth of weed, marijuana in my pocket, and that I was just going to go away and smoke a bunch of pot and try to force a spiritual experience. I didn't tell her about it. Now, if you don't know, she's from Colombia. She don't play. But I was like, I'm sneaky. I can do this. So I went up, drove to Vermont on my spiritual retreat, anybody? And uh, as I was on my spiritual retreat, I went out into the woods. I found a nice little spot next to a river. I sat there by myself. There ain't nobody else. Like, you, I could have I been dying out there. Nobody would have heard me. Don't matter. I was in the middle of nowhere. And I was sitting there smoking. Yeah, hanging out, smoking, smoking weed. And then all of a sudden, the conviction of God hit me in a way that has never happened before or since. And I, and I felt like God was heartbroken because I had mistreated his daughter and I had lied to her. And that God had been so good to me in my life that when I was born again in the gutter, he took me out of the stinking gutter, man. And like cleaned me off and like took me to himself and loved me when no one else loved me, right? When no one else could love me like that. People were worried about me. People loved me, but they didn't love me like that. They couldn't love me like that. And God took me to himself, cleaned me off, spoke his word over me, caused me to start to grow, and I grew, and I grew. I learned how to, like, walk in the Christian faith a little bit. He gave me an amazing wife that I did not deserve. Amazing. And I went, and I lied to her, and I broke our trust and I went away and I did what I was doing. And God brought that conviction on me. I've never felt that way, like I said before, or since. It was like, I felt like, I almost felt like the grace of God was lifted from my life. And I was there. It was so intense for me. Like, I was like, I was bawling my eyes out. I was bawling my eyes out. 
And I felt like my thoughts were boiling. Like I could not escape this feeling. And I fell on my face and I was like next to the river and I'm bawling my eyes out, like rolling around in the rocks next to the river, crying out to God. And I'm like, I'm like convinced that he doesn't hear me anymore because for some reason, like I, the enemy is telling me, yeah, you have screwed up. You have broken this thing. You have done the impossible to forgive. Your wife's gonna be like broken trust, all these different things. And God's upset with me. And I just felt in that moment, I just felt like condemned, condemnation like I never felt before. I don't know if you've ever done something stupid like that, something messed up, something rough. If you made some mistakes in your past, if you think about it and you kind of crack that, that chest in your own life and you're like, what's in there? Oh God, I don't want to look in there because there's things in there that we don't want to see, things in there that kind of creep out sometimes, like emotional affairs at work maybe. Or maybe someone was talking to you and they were flirting with you and you knew you should run away, but you kind of liked the attention, so you lingered just a little bit too long. Maybe someone reached out to you for help and you're like, yes, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there. And then time went by and you kind of forgot and you kind of thought it was awkward and you kind of didn't call them back, but you knew they were struggling, but you didn't do anything, but you said you would do something and you knew if you were a good brother or sister that you would have done something, but now the time has passed and now it's been six months and if you call them now, it's going to be weird. So then more time goes on and you remember when you said you would be there, but you were not there, you let that person down, you let your word down, you let God down, maybe. Maybe you had a fight with a family member years ago and things came out of your mouth that you could not scoop up off the ground to put back in. It's been said and it can't be unsaid. And maybe, maybe in the middle of the night those things come creeping out and try to Go for your neck. You see, love covers a multitude of sins. I know some people, some people who came to know the Lord and they started strong. They love God. It's like, yeah. But as time went by and the years passed, things crept in. A little bit of too much love for money. A little bit of too much love for distractions of the world maybe relationships or something that they knew they weren't supposed to get into, but they kind of made the choice and got into it. And the Lord kind of faded a little bit behind them because they got their eyes focused on the wrong thing. Is that something that keeps you up at night? Because the Lord and his amazing power and grace covers even that if you will turn to him, if you will turn to him and trust him. You see that? Same God that wrote and engraved with his finger on those tablets of stone is that same God who wrote in the dust with his finger in that moment. They were trying to use the law that he had written himself in stone. But now into the dust he writes what? What is he writing? What is he, why is he doing this? Why is he bent over writing with his finger? And many commentaries have been written over the years. Many smart people and scholars are like, well, we think that maybe he was writing the sins of the Pharisees that were there. And they were ready to stone this woman. But then they looked down and saw he was writing like, Jeremiah cheated on his wife. Obadiah stole money from whoever. Is that what he's doing on the ground? Is that what he's writing? The sins of these other people, the sins of the Pharisees? Or maybe he's writing down the sins of the woman caught in adultery. I think he's writing the sins of you and me. Randy <laughs> lied to his wife, mistreated so-and-so, said he would be there and wasn't. I think he's writing maybe the sins of you and me, but the good news is that your sins, my sins, you see, the law was written in stone, but in Christ, the charges against us are only written in the sand. 
And if you were to go outside right now and you were to find a little piece of dirt out there and you were to write something in the dirt outside today, it would be gone tomorrow, right? Right? The law was written in stone, but in Christ and only in Christ. Remember he said, go and sin no more. In Christ, the charges against us are only written in sand. You see, he took our punishment so that we, by his great love, could receive mercy. And maybe you're something like me. Maybe, maybe you deal with this like inner condemnation sometimes and anxiety that comes up because of the things that we've done and the things that we can't control in our past, the stuff that we did yesterday or earlier today that you're like, oh. Because there's an enemy. There's a real-life enemy. And I don't know if you, if you realize, like, it's one of those crazy things. Like, sometimes in Scripture, you'll see, you'll see these little depictions of the enemy, Satan himself. And he's called the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the brothers and sisters, basically the accuser of Christians. <clears throat> and in Revelation and even in Job, it depicts Satan up in heaven, right, up in the heavenly realm, and he's next to the throne of God, of the Lord himself, and all he's doing next to the throne of God is accusing you and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, all of the brothers and sisters in Christ, and me, he's accusing each and every one of us. It says day and night, Satan is just accusing you and me, the brothers and sisters in Christ, before the Lord. He's saying, do you see your law, Lord? Do you see the punishment, the wages of sin is death? Well, let me tell you about the sin of this person, and that person, and this person. And, oh, we thought this was a long time ago. This one was today. This one was five Five minutes ago, that's what he is doing. He is like a lion looking to devour. He came to steal and kill and destroy. Thank God. For the mercy of Jesus that is only found in Jesus. Don't trick yourself and do the thing where it's like, you know you did something wrong, your spouse knew you did something wrong, and it's like, well, God's not mad at me anymore, so what are you, what's the big deal with you? And we use it sometimes as a convenient shield to hide behind, but we're not really repentant of our sin. Have you looked to the Lord and asked him and just laid yourself bare and said, Lord, I need your grace, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness, God. There is an enemy. He is an accuser. He will try to bring shame and condemnation. He will try to steal that forgiveness and that grace. Well, we need to stand on the promise of God. If we don't stand on the promise of God, then what good is it? We're going to wilt under that pressure, under that condemnation. Nobody can stand unless we stand in Jesus. So when the Romans says, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are what? Covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Have we grasped this great grace and this mercy and truth? There's a book called The Pilgrim's Progress. It's an old book. Nobody reads it anymore, barely. But it's the idea of a, a person who's a Christian is like coming out of the old life, coming out of like the, the world and the wickedness of their old life. And it's, his progress is that he's traveling from like the, the world of death and destruction and he's traveling along the way and he's trying to get to the city, to like the city of God. And as he's traveling along the way, he comes across all these different traps and these different, these different difficult obstacles and things. And when he finally is coming to the end and he's nearing that great city of God, the enemy himself stands in front of him in his full-on scary glory, huge dragon-looking thing with, with wings and teeth. And he stands in front of Christian in between between him and his goal, and he starts to bring up all the stuff that Christian had done. He says, oh, you think you're going in there, huh? You think that you belong in there? Don't you remember that even in your life when you set out on this journey, you almost gave up, and you screwed up over here, and you did this thing over there. You deal with anxiety. Where's your faith? You got anxiety. What are you, a baby? Oh, you're depressed. Where's your God? I thought you trust in God. 
That was the voice of the enemy right there standing in front of him. And the Christian, Christian says, all of this is true and much more that you have left out. But the Lord that I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. I have obtained pardon from my Lord. And at that, Satan couldn't stand against him. Psalm 103 is a promise. He has removed our sins as far from us as east is from the west. East is from the west. I don't even know which way east is. East is. I just know that they're far apart from each other. There we go. I'm trusting this guy. He says east. He looks, he looks like, yeah, and west. But those are far from each other. And he says that the Lord has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Do you know that grace today? Do you know that mercy today? Do you know that love of God today? Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you in this place and in this time, God, that you are still moving, still living and active, God, that your mercy is still extending to our lives, still great, Lord, that your love still covers a multitude of sins, Lord. We cannot stand before you based on ourself, Lord. We need to stand before you based on what you have done and who you are. The scripture does say that the wages of sin is death, Lord, but you, God, died on the cross, took that punishment for us so that we can have life and be free. I just pray for your peace over people that are struggling with sin, Lord, that are struggling with their, their past, God, that you would bless them with your peace, Lord, that even surpasses their understanding that mistakes and sin of the past are in the grave where they belong, covered by your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your promise that when we come to you, Lord, that you are just ready to forgive, God, that you love so great, Lord, that you remove our sin as far from us as east is from the west. Thank you for that amazing grace. 